Good morning. Good morning, friends. Hey, Brother Mike, back on uh, Sunday Morning Podcast. HardcoreChristianity.com. Welcome to the Arizona Deliverance Center. This is our Sunday Morning Podcast for shut-ins. I would appreciate it if you would refer this uh, podcast out to people who um, are shut-ins. I'd love to have a shut-in ministry on Sunday mornings. And... Uh, I'd love to be able to, uh, you know, visit with people who are not physically or practically able to go to church on Sunday mornings. That would be great. Please remember that uh, the Arizona Deliverance Center, we're downtown on 15th Avenue, just south of Osborne Road, downtown Phoenix. It's uh, the red brick building there on the uh, the west side. And uh, we have two, two live services every week, Thursday and Friday nights at 7 o'clock. And we have preaching, teaching, healing, and deliverance at both of those services. We have uh, several Zoom services now every week. We've got uh, one on Monday nights for the ladies, Wednesday night for everybody, and Saturday night for everybody at 6 and 6.30 p.m. And you can pick this up off the website, hardcorechristianity.com. And uh, we also have special services like women's seminars. The Children's Deliverance Service is coming up again in August. If you have a preteen who needs prayer, please, my goodness, please bring them. We have a unique ministry, different from any other ministry anywhere in the southwestern part of the United States. The Holy Spirit moves in 100% of the services. It's very strange. Very strange to most churches. But that was a major desire prayer desire of mine when I first started the ministry in 2005, I wanted to see the Holy Spirit move. And uh, by God's grace and mercy, he granted it. And so every single service you come to, the Holy Spirit's moving. People are either getting healed or delivered or healed of soul wounds or something's happening in the service and he's moving to heal. We're We're like a hospital in Phoenix. We're not a church. We don't try to, we're not trying to build a church or develop a big congregation. We're trying to be a hospital that people bring sick people to. And they've been doing it for several years now. And it has been, it's been fantastic. Thank you. Got a, got another good one for you today. People often ask me and have asked ministers literally uh, for 2000 years, how can I, develop the power of God. How do I do that? Is there a key a key ingredient, something that I could kind of look to? Is there a how-to list? Is there a map? Is there a pattern? The answer to all those questions is yes. And God wants you to do it. He wants you to be part of it. 100%. You can be sure of that. What is that pattern? What is that map? Let's take a look at it. Luke chapter 18. This is one of the stories in the Bible that doesn't get a lot of doesn't get a lot of play. But uh, that's because the devil hates this story. It drives him crazy. His scales start falling off or something when he when he has to listen to this story. I hope that happens to him today because I'm going to read it out loud to him. Luke chapter 18, verse 9, God's miracle working power. Here it is. Do you want to be used by God supernaturally and miraculously with signs and wonders? Is that a true statement? Yes or no? If it's a yes, please listen to me carefully today. Verse 9. Jesus spoke a parable uh, to people. He said, and the people that he was speaking it to were individuals who trusted not in God, but themselves. They trusted themselves that what they were doing led to righteousness and that other people who didn't do what they did, they despised them. They despised them. That's what verse 9 says. Verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. 
Greek word Pharisaeus. Pharisees were very unique people. Uh, they were very intelligent, had huge IQs, they were very highly educated. They all had doctor's degree. Paul was a Pharisee. And um, they were very bright. Paul was exceptionally bright, uh, had an Einstein level or higher IQ, extremely well educated, and unlike the other Pharisees, was far more active in service to God. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. So Paul said. And the other guy that went up there was a publican, it says, Greek word telonis, that means a tax farmer. Now, these publicans were at the bottom of Jewish society. Just above them were whores. You got a Pharisee here, you got a whore here. They were at the bottom of the Jewish society. <clears throat> and these uh, publicans here, Telonis, they had sold their soul to the Romans and they collected taxes from the other Jews. And so they would increase the tax amount on certain things. You know, I guess gangsters call that skimming. And they would skim off the surplus and put it in their pockets. Remember the story of Zechariah? He was a uh, he was rich, the Bible said. He was a he was a um, publican supervisor, or like a regional manager, or a district manager. So the skim that the uh, publicans stole <clears throat> from the Jews, that part of that skim had to be turned over to Zacharias because he was, or excuse me, Zacchaeus. He was at the top of the Tax farmers. Remember that story? Zacchaeus? Yeah. He was short. And then Jesus said, look, the Pharisee came into the temple and he stood there and prayed with himself. And he said this. The, the Pharisee said 37 words in his prayer. And he said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men extortioners, unjust people, adulterers, or that publican over there. He points his finger over there at the tax farmer. He was already in the temple before the Pharisee got there. The tax farmer was already there. The guy at the bottom of our society, in, in Jewish society, was already in the temple before the Pharisee got there. The Pharisee points over there at him. He goes, hey, see that scum bucket over there? <clears throat> see that human garbage right there? I'm not like that. And then he says, explains why he's not like that guy. He says, I fast twice a week. I tithe on everything I own. Self-justification. He's praying with himself. He's not, he's not praying to God. He's praying with himself. That's what religious hypocrites do. That's what religious people do. They always look to what they do as their justification in the eyes of a God they don't know. And then it says the publican, the tax farmer, uh, he was standing afar off. He didn't come up to the front of the temple. He stayed in the back. And he wouldn't even lift up his eyes to see the grandeur of Herod's temple. Wouldn't even lift his eyes up, it says. Wouldn't even come close to all the spectacular artifacts, paintings, sculptings that was in the temple. Just one of the great wonders of the world, Herod's temple. He wouldn't even look up. He wouldn't even come down there. He wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. He would just look down. He was down. That tax farmer knew what he was doing. See, when you go on porn, when you yell at your family, when you curse and swear, when you pitch a fit, when you go nuts, your conscience is screaming at you. Beep, 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 
beep, beep, beep. That is wrong. That is wrong. This tax fa farmer, this publican, lived 24-7 with the knowledge in his soul that what he was doing was a sin. He was wrong. He knew it. Right here. When you go back on porn, you know that's wrong. When you scream at somebody, spouse, kids, whatever, you know that's wrong. When you cheat at school, at work, whatever, you know that's wrong. Well, he knew it was wrong. He knew it was wrong, but he couldn't stop. Why? Obviously, the love of money is the root of all evil. Hey, you got to do what you got to do to survive. So the publican stands over there and he smotes his, his breast like that. He smote upon his breath, breast. Stephos is the Greek word, chest. He went like this. That was a, that was a pattern, a society, societal pattern back then of illustrating grief. I'm so sorry, you know, right? For example, if you speak sign language, when you go like this, that, that's a sign of expressing certain emotion. Back then, when you pounded on your chest, you were e expressing an emotion. The emotion was grief. When, an ele when a gorilla pounds on his chest, he's expressing an emotion, warning. He's issuing a warning to somebody. If you come into this area, you're going to get your face kicked in. So a gorilla pounds on his that was a method of expressing emotions. Okay? Same way with sign language or any other language. He was pounding on his breast here. You know, it's, it's similar to habits that our society has developed. You know, if something goes bad, you go, oh, no. You know, you put your hands on your head, almost like a reaction. Hey, I'm having an emotion. Here's how I'm expressing it. Oh, no, watch it. Well, he would pound on his chest in the back, showing, showing he was grieving. And he said seven words. The Pharisee spoke 34 words. And the publican spoke seven. He said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said in verse 14, I tell you, this man, this man went down to his home justified. Dikaia is a Greek verb that means to be declared innocent. You see, you and I are as guilty as sin. And there's nothing we can do about it. You and I and every human being that ever lived, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God are guaranteed to go to hell. But mercy through the blood of Christ has yielded you and I justification. Dikaio means you have been declared innocent when you were guilty. And like in our criminal justice system, you can have certain crimes expunged. Expunged. That means the thing's taken off your record. That's what justification is. You have been declared innocent when you were guilty. Nikaiao. Boom. It's done. Jesus said the, the tax farmer who wouldn't even come to the front, who kept his, wouldn't even lift his head up. He was down, beating his breast with grief. He left because he was praying to God, not himself. Religious people are usually gut-wrenching hypocrites, and they don't know it. They don't know God, but they think they know him. I've had that happen to me dozens of times over the years in the deliverance ministry, where I've had people come to me for deliverance and then start telling me how to do deliverance when they came to me. Then Jesus lets out the big step toward your desire, signs, wonders, and miracles. He says, 
everyone who exalts themselves. Hupsao is the Greek word. It means to elevate yourself. It's almost like letting go of a hot air balloon. It just goes up to itself. There it goes. There you go. Everyone who exalts himself shall be, what? Tapenao, abased, it says in the King James. It means to be depressed or humbled. If you exalt yourself, you will eventually be brought down. What goes up must come down. He that humbles himself, humbles himself, tap, same Greek word, tapinao, depresses himself, humbles himself, brings himself low, shall be hupsao, exalted. Here you see God showing you something just incredible. One of the keys to the incredible power of God. And then the next story in this chapter, almost this entire story has this theme. This chapter has the same theme I'm sharing with you right now. In the next story in that chapter, Luke 18, incredible chapter, if you're interested in God's miracle working power, are the story of the parents who brought their babies for Jesus to touch them and bless them. Verse 15, they brought unto Jesus infants, Greek word brephos means a baby, infant, that he would touch them and bless them. And his disciples saw it and they rebuked the parents. And here's how sick this is. Again, the disciples were like the Pharisees, just bankrupt religious people. Epitomao is the Greek word you would, that is used in the Bible almost exclusively to rebuke demons. That's the Greek word used when Jesus rebuked demons. Epitomao, it means to, to forbid them, to bind them, to rebuke their behavior or their words. They rebuke these parents for bringing their babies to Jesus. Now, parents who love their kids, if you met Christ, the first thing you do is bring the baby over there. Parents want their children blessed, even if they aren't blessed. People want their children in heaven, even if they are going to hell. Parental love covers things that it doesn't cover of the self. And Jesus called them over and he said, listen, suffer these little children to come to me for, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. You're looking for signs, wonders, miracles. You're looking for the power of God. And the moving of the Spirit, this is what you're looking for. The kingdom of God, that's what you're looking for. Well, to get it, you have to become as a little child. Verse 17, verily I say to you, whoever shall, shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child. Now he switches over. He uses the Greek word paideon. Okay, paideon is not a brephos, a baby, an infant. Now he switches over to a toddler, a three-year-old, a two, a two or three or four-year-old kid, a paideon. Whoever will not receive the kingdom of God as a little kid, a toddler, a youngster, shall, shall never enter it. Wow. So you can see how far the Pharisee was. He elevated himself, but he was brought down to hell, just like Lucifer, Isaiah chapter 14. I will exalt myself to the start. Boom, you shall be brought down to hell. Sheol, Hebrew word. Our Greek word, uh, hadis, hell, the fires of hell. I will exalt myself. No, you're going to be brought down. You got to get into the kingdom of God and make it like a little child. What's the story on little children? They're humble. They're eager to learn. They listen. They have natural joy. What are little kids like? You know exactly what they're like. 
Well, that's what Jesus was telling you. He knew they knew exactly what little kids are like, and he was using that illustration. The emotions of a child, the attitude of a child. The attitude of the Pharisee, no, never going to work. Then, remarkably, in the same chapter, Luke 18, this is so great, it's hard to believe. The story of the rich young ruler. This young rich rich young ru ruler raised in an uh, orthodox Jewish family meticulously kept the commandments of God. And don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Do this, do that, do that, do this. His entire life. And he followed the rules, followed the rules. And he was either a very good businessman or he inherited a lot from his parents who were very good businessmen, but it doesn't give the revelation here. But we know one thing. Uh, it says here, he was wealthy. Jesus said to him, you know what the commandments are. Don't do this, that, this, and that, and this, and that, and this, and that, and this, and that. And the guy goes, I have kept all these commandments from the time I was a youth, okay, till now. And then Jesus looked at him, the gift of knowledge working at maximum capacity, sees into the guy's soul. He says, you lack one thing. You've got greed in your soul. Money and material things mean something to you. For the love of money is the root of all evil. You've got it. And Jesus looked at him lovingly and caringly and said, look, go home. Have a big old yard sale. Donate, give away, sell, whatever you got to do. Come and follow me. Why did Jesus say that? Because this guy had the personality that Christ liked. The guy was a sincere person. He loved God. But he was contaminated by the cancer of greed. So Jesus said, fix this greed thing, and you've got all the ingredients to be a powerful man of God. Come and follow me. And you're going to have treasure in heaven you're not even going to believe. In the long run, you will have given up nothing, but you have gained so much more. Everything you sacrifice in this life for Christ is a gain in heaven exponentially greater. Follow me, he said. And the guy who saw, heard him say that, he was very sour, sourful because he was rich. Plusius, wealthy. He had a lot of material possessions. He had a lot of money. The guy went away sorrowful, Jesus said. Sorrowful. Ugh, he was sick. And Jesus said, how hardly, how rarely, how, how difficult it is for people to enter the kingdom of God who have riches. That sounds like a contradiction, but it isn't. The Greek word echo means to be gripping something hard. Like, like for example, Otani grabs the bat and he grips it hard when he knocks another home run. Echo, when a carpenter hits a hammer, he, echo, he grabs that hammer. If you lose it, if you loosely, you, you can't use it. That's what Jesus is saying here. People who have clutched on to Plusius, riches, wealth, money. It's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, for them to enter heaven. And the disciples, as you know, were, were shocked. They couldn't believe it. Then, in the same chapter, Starting at verse 31, Luke 18, Jesus then tells, same theme here. He t starts to tell the disciples about him dying. 
and being tortured and butchered and murdered by the Jews and the Romans. The disciples couldn't believe it. They were already literally shocked when he told them about people who were wealthy clutching their riches, echo, gripping it. How rare, if not impossible, for them to get into heaven. It is possible because with God all things are possible, but the probability, very, very low. They were stunned from that, mind numbed. Then he drops an another bomb on the same theme, humbleness. Bringing yourself, he that humbles himself shall be exalted. That was the life of Christ. He lived a life of servanthood, and now he is exalted in glory at the right hand of Father, King of kings and Lord of lords. And the, and the disciples are like, oh my, this is nuts. We were building a great religion here. We, we could have had a massive movement that it would stretch from one country to the other, and you're going to get killed and you're leaving. They freaked. They fell apart. Again, same theme. Rich Lung ruler. Humble yourself. Jesus dying, humble himself. The sinner and the Pharisee, humble yourself. And then at the end of the chapter, Luke 18, absolute brilliance, Holy Ghost brilliance here. He put this thing together like a masterpiece. Fantastic. A blind man gets healed at the end of the chapter. Your eyes are open, and now you see spiritually. All these stories about humbling yourself, and then your blind eyes open. And now you can see. What a great chapter, friend. It's your ticket to miracles from God. Unfortunately, sacrifices have to be made, and there isn't anybody else to make them except you. You're it. Don't go to your church and expect this to happen there. It's not going to happen. Those are sheep running through the church, sitting in the pew there, sitting in the chairs, hanging around the coffee shop at the church, coming and watching a movie at the church, The Chosen or something. Okay, that, that group there is not going to make it. The only person that's going to make it is you. You're going to have to make major changes in your life to humble yourself. Selfishness and self-centeredness is the polar opposite of these stories in Luke 18, the miracles of Luke 18. And that's you. That's what you're going to do. That's how you're going to live, just like that. You're going to come through just like the Lord said. You're not going to be a rich young ruler, are you? Well, Brother Mike, I know I'm not like a rich, the rich young ruler. I don't have any money anyway. No, but you've got other things. You've got relationships, friends. Hobbies, addictions, vices. And they all need to go. Sell all that you have. Come follow me. Get rid of what you have. Your crummy friends, your insane relatives, your idiotic habits, your crazy addictions. All of it. All of it. And yet, let my dog Lexi's yelling in the background saying amen. That's her way of saying amen. You got to bag all this stuff, friend. It's got to go. I don't know if you've looked around in our country lately, but uh, the whole country's going to hell in a handbasket. There's no way to stop it. It's not going to stop. It's all going to get worse. There's a great financial crisis coming. Everything's going to happen to us. Well, we're going to get Trump in. Okay, we have, yeah, Trump's coming in, and a lot of things will probably get better for a while, but the overall picture, Satan's got this thing in his palm of his hand. 
and the church gave it to him. Satan, demons, sinners, politicians, billionaires, they're not at fault for this country. Churches are. Churches did not fulfill the Great Commission. They did not follow the Great Commandments of evangelism. They left out Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, threw it out and decided we'll do it the denominational way. We'll do it the denominational way. And the country went just like this. I mean, absolutely down a rat hole. Jesus said, here's how you do it, this way. And the churches went that way. But not you. You're going to break out of the pack. You're going to leave the rest behind. You're going to get rid of all you have. You're going to humble yourself. And then you're going to get your eyes opened. Your spiritual eyes are going to be healed. And you're going to follow the Lord. you got to be a lonely person to follow the Lord. Because you got to used, got to be used to being by yourself much of the time. I was living in delusions when I got into the ministry years ago. I entered the deliverance ministry the healing ministry, in one day. It happened to me in one day. I was at a jail service in Maricopa County. I was at the Estrella unit for women. And it was my first visit there. It was my first service. And the director of our jail ministry program at the Dream Center in Scottsdale brought me along that day. So it was just she and I. Well, she got up and gave a short little Bible study and said a few things. I can't even remember what she said. The day was so traumatic. This actually happened to me. It happened to me exactly what I'm telling it to you. She got done and said, now, Brother Mike, this is his first day here. He wants to say a few words. I didn't know what to say. There was a bunch of women in the service. They were all wearing orange outfits. Some of them looked demon-possessed. Some of them uh, looked like normal people. Some of the women were really ugly. Some of them were like very attractive. I mean, it was a, it was a box of chalk, so you didn't know what you were going to get. They were all there. I got up and I started, I had recently been delivered from demons when this happened. I started sharing some of my testimony and the Holy Ghost jumped on me. That had never happened to me before. I'd been in church for years, but in a certain way, he jumped on me. It's weird. I started crying like a baby right in front of all these women and in front of the, the jail ministry director who brought me that day. She was just kind of staring at me, staring at the women. I, I, I slumped up against the wall. I put my head down like that sinner in the temple, and I started crying on the wall with my head down. Brick, uh, excuse me, block. It was bl everything made out of block in the jail, obviously. I got my head down. I'm weeping up against the wall. This went on for about 60 seconds, 120 seconds, something like that. I turned around and looked up, and the Holy Ghost had fallen on the room like a Catherine Kuhlman service in miniature. All the women in the room were crying except two of them. Everybody was crying. The director of the jail program from the Dream Center could not believe her eyes. I didn't know what to do. I'd never had an altar call before like that. So the jail director lady got up and started leading people to Christ and leading them in sinner's prayer, having them turn their hearts over to the Lord. And it was just one end of the room to the other 
convicts everywhere, crying and repenting to God. Crying and repenting to God. What happened that day? What did that happen because I was a great person? Oh, far from it. I had adopted the venue of the publican. And the Spirit of God took off. And from that day to this day, every service I've ever had, he took off. I soon left that mega church, the Dream Center. I soon I soon left there. I started my deliverance ministry there. I was helping lots of people that church, but it started to get too big, so I got the boot. And the boot was the best thing that happened to me because I started the House of Healing, then went to the Arizona Deliverance Center, then opened the Healing House, and it all went that way. But it all started in Luke chapter 18. You don't want to be like a Pharisee, do you? Super intelligent, so intelligent you have no anointing. Have you ever noticed that really intelligent Christians have zero anointing? Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> you don't have anything? Oh, yeah. People that are too smart can't handle the gospel. They overthink and overprocess spiritual things, and they end up dead. People that are incredibly dumb, stupid, imbecilic type people don't do well with the gospel either. They can't grasp the basics and apply it. It doesn't work. It's better to be somewhere in the middle, like you and I. Kind of in the middle is good. Because if you're in the middle, you can read Luke 18 and go, you know what, I see a pattern here. I need to do this. I need to do this. That service that day in the jails, I'll never forget as long as I live. It opened up my jail ministry. I went there two or three times a week, sometimes four, for two years. And every single service, the Spirit of God moved. I had packed services over there, men and women services. Couldn't wait. They couldn't wait to get there because the Spirit of God was going to show. And I was going to pull a tax collector and let the Lord do it and let me get out of the way. How about you? You might have to go this alone for a bit, friends. God will bring people to help you later. He did me. I got a wonderful staff at the Arizona Deliverance Center now. I had nobody in the beginning. I just did everything myself. Then I picked up two people, they helped. God's not going to let you out there alone forever, but you may have to go it alone for a while. You may have to take some hard decisions home with you. Jesus had to take a very hard decision. He told them in Luke 18, the Romans and the Jews are going to arrest me and spit on me, beat me. They're going to crucify me on the cross and murder me. And I'm going to die. Yeah. Now, I could never do something like that. I, the thought of it wouldn't even come into my mind. He was, Christ, as you know, was for, so far out of my league, it's not even, a, it'd be a joke to even make any kind of a comparison at all. I would never do that. But Jesus took the lonely road. And he's not lonely anymore. And you may have to take a lonely road now. But you won't be alone for long. He that elevates himself shall be humbled. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. Remember, it's all contained in your free will. Yeah, I love you. I'll see you next time. Thanks for recommending Sunday mornings.